may have seen in the agenda something about Peter Wall being involved in uh, physical therapy equipment sales and continuing education. And doing a lot of that continuing education, I typically would get up in front of a, a large group of physical therapists and ask them to raise their hand, how many of you from Iowa? Or what are your Iowa roots? So us Iowa people have this weird sense about uh, the state of Iowa, friends, et cetera, et cetera. So, Indulge me just a little bit. I'd like to start off with uh, this. question, how did I get here? Uh, I'm sort of new to neuro. Now, if you want to learn how to run the DynaWave high voltage stimulator or electroacupuncture or something about vestibular falling in the elderly, I'm pretty good at that. In the last year or so, I have become involved with interactive motion. The Iowa connection, as you can see, uh, that guy in the background is uh, helping to install the first uh, computer system. I should say, mainframe system at the University of Iowa. Uh, that went ahead real quick, but you should have seen Dr. Van Allen uh, of the Space Belt fame and Dr. Lindquist of the Educational Measurement fame. The small print there talks about uh, Helen uh, Hazlip getting her degree at the University of Iowa and using the predecessor of the IBM 650 computer, which is a drum machine of the magnificent capacity of 2K memory. Uh, the last slide that clicked up there was uh, a cousin of my dad's uh, from Iowa State University, my alma mater also. Uh, this cousin was one of the discoverers of plutonium uh, at Cal Berkeley in 1943. And very, uh, quite a bit of work as far as developing Manhattan Project. Now, uh, when I was asked to do this presentation, uh, I, my AFib kicked up when I almost had a heart attack in terms of being able to do it. But we figured out the best way to do this uh, was really uh, you uh, saw that uh, Ego Krebs is in Japan. Uh, you also saw that Neville Hogan was at a different meeting. You also saw that the CEO of the company was busy as the Dickens because of a lot of orders coming in and he's got a ticket sitting uh, there at his desk, ready to go to Brazil, I think, tomorrow or Monday. So this you ended up with the fourth stringer. But uh, thinking about some of those old days in the computer business, I was trying to tie that back to technologies we were talking about. Some of that technology, which you probably didn't notice, but there was an IBM punch card in my shirt pocket there. Uh, there's only one other person that can sort of understand that, particularly wiring of control panels for IBM 407 accounting machines, and that's Dave Cartram there, understands some of that old technology. The new technology, though, uh, I've sort of learned to use, I think, <laughs> with helpful glasses. education uh, audio tape uh, audio tape along with his slides so with Camtasia program I was able to create the following thanks for watching and stay with us there's much more ahead on CNN including today's edition of pioneers take a look MIT scientists Hermano Ego Krebs and Neville Hogan are using robots to help stroke victims with brain injuries regain movement. 
Their arm robots have already helped patients move shoulders and wrists, enabling them to do things they couldn't do for themselves, like shower or put on clothes. It isn't just a matter of moving. We are seeing something that looks like we're influencing a change in the brain. But I think that's probably the most important thing we've seen so far. Now they're focusing on the lower extremities with ankle bots, which they hope will not only help patients walk again, but also help avoid dangerous falls after their strokes. The robots work by providing a video game on a screen, which prompts users to perform an exercise. If they don't make that movement within a certain period of time, then the robot will initiate it. If they do make a movement within that period of time, the robot goes along with it and helps them. So what we think is happening is that the visual display evokes the intent to move. A short time later, movement actually happens, and that sensory information comes back up to the brain. A future goal is to one day have an entire robotic gym for all parts of the body. Okay, now we've got the real presentation. Uh, this is a... Uh, Dr. Pettis was here. I do mention that for you that not, do not know him, uh, his first language is Portuguese, his second language is English, and his third language is German. So you may see some, if you will, different pronunciations, etc. Next, Hermano I. Krebs, Principal Research Scientist, Newman Laboratory for Biomechanics and Human Rehabilitation, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cambridge discusses the use of robotics in stroke and cerebral palsy rehabilitation. Let me tell you a little about this technology and why no, we think it's a new paradigm shift. So there was many people before us that did use robotics as assistive technology. So examples of assistive technology is a wheelchair or my pair of glasses. It helps the person interact with the environment. But what we tried to do was techniques or technology to help the clinician while they are delivering therapy. And hopefully the patient when leave the facility might not need any technology to assist them. And that's why we say that this was a paradigm shift. Now, one thing that I learned, not by attending a business school, but just listening to people that are talking in the business school, they say, what is the motto of innovation? The motto of innovation is need, need, need. So the first question that we have to try to answer is that, is there a need for this type of technology? Now, if we look like here in the US, we see that the numbers are pretty compelling. So there is around 795,000 strokes every year with a very significant economical burden and a very significant need with 7% of the survivors in need of therapy following a stroke. There is at least 6 million stroke survivors in the US and if we look to other areas, the need is even larger. If you look to Europe, there is at least 900,000, perhaps 1.1, depending how you define the borders of Europe. In Japan, it's 210,000 new strokes every year. And while in the developed world, this is the third cause of death, in the developing world is the first one. So both in Brazil and in China is the first cause of death. So this is not only a problem of the developed world, but also the developing one. And we know that this will get even more pressing. Because if we look to the population, this is data from the UN of people over 65, and we know that stroke with aging, the population that has a stroke increase. And the average is that we'll have of the order of 25% of the population over 65 years of age by 2050. And that's why we started before in 1989, trying to see what we could do to address this problem. What could we try to do to facilitate the treatment with people in need? Since we started this, one of the nice things is that now there is many groups all around the world that are developing this type of technology. So this was something not very scientific that I did. I took Google Scholar and I took per year and I saw how many papers were published with a few keywords. And if you do just the word robotics, you get a number that is of the order of 600, 700. This was for 2008. 600 to 700 academic papers are published per year. But when you just put rehabilitation robotics of service robotics, you see that half of the papers with the word robotics are in service robotics or rehabilitation robotics. So there is a very large number of groups now trying to develop this technology 
And my goal today is to show you that perhaps there is a good reason for that, that actually it makes a difference. Now, we didn't start this in a vacuum. This was part of a shift that was taking place. Before the 1970s and 80s, the perception was that the brain was hardwired and there wasn't that much you could do after stroke. So that perception was something that took us quite some time to learn that was not correct. It was a very clear division saying very specific areas would be responding to very specific functions, which is not untrue, but it's avoiding answering a very important thing that we learned in the 1970s and 80s that plasticity occur and it's something very important. Here's an example that I like to show because for me it was the example that convinced me more than anything else about this idea of plasticity. This is the work of Randy Noodle from Kansas City where he mapped on a monkey the area responding to the hands. And after mapping this area well, he come and make a small lesion in the area representing the hand in the monkey. And what he did is that he separated this in two groups. One group of monkeys were then released and did not receive any specific training for the hand that was impaired. They were able to do everything in the AI environment. And what you see is that the area representing the hand actually did shrunk. When you look here to the other group that they have actually to do some therapy, in this case is that there was a machine where there was small foot pallets and the monkey has to go put the finger and grab the foot pallets that were placed in holes that every time were getting smaller and smaller. What he saw is that the area representing the hand not only maintained, but actually perhaps even became larger than previously. So this was a very good example of plasticity. And it's under this perception that we created this technology or started to develop this technology. The technology didn't come in a vacuum. It came under this idea that was perhaps better explained in 1949 by Tab, where he essentially was suggesting that neurons that fire together would wire together. So this was fundamental, perhaps a short sentence describing plasticity. Of course, there is what we might call positive or good plasticity and malplasticity. And this is some data that we can look in the literature saying that if two neurons fire together, they would reinforce each other. If one fire and the other one does not, it doesn't change the strength of the connection. But if they fire in different timings, actually what you do is that you see a long-term depression. So this is where we introduced this idea of rehab robotics. We were trying perhaps, if plasticity was real, to try to create tools to help the clinician in increase the productivity and also have an impact on the treatment of the patient. And that's again, that's what I'm trying here to separate between what was done before and this concept of creating tools to help the clinician deliver therapy. Now let me talk a little about the American Heart Association guidelines that came in 2010, because I think it was a nice surprise to see when they published that. But it's telling us that they are quite happy with the results that they have seen in the literature, not only from our group, but by multiple groups on the use of robot-assisted motor rehabilitation for the upper extremity. So here is a snapshot of their guidelines for the constraint-induced movement therapy and robot-assisted therapy for upper extremity. They gave class one level evidence A for the outpatient and the chronic, and class two A for the inpatient setting where we have less data. So class one means the benefit is much larger than the risk and the procedure treatment should be performed. And level evidence A means that multiple populations were evaluated and that are derived from multiple randomized clinical trials. And class two A is that the benefits is larger than the risk, additional studies should be performed, but it's reasonable to perform or administer the procedure. So this is a very nice endorsement. And just to give you a comparison, most pharma companies would love to be into this category. So this is the same category that they would be using to qualify pharmaceutical products. This is the same snapshot from the VA guidelines. And here you have their rating. They actually didn't separate inpatient from outpatients. They put them all together. And they say, B, a recommendation that clinicians provide the service to eligible patients. At least fair evidence was found that the intervention improved health outcomes and concludes that the benefits outweigh the harm. 
and the recommendation is made against routinely providing the intervention for symptomatic patients. At least fair evidence was found that the intervention is ineffective or that harms outweigh benefits. And I call your attention for that because for the upper extremity, they gave us a B. Again, they don't separate chronic from inpatient. So they gave us a B that they recommend robot-assisted movement therapy as an adjunct conventional therapy. And for the lower extremities, they gave a D. There is no sufficient evidence supporting the use of robotic device during aid training post-stroke. So I'll try to show you some evidence to support that and perhaps suggest that we can do better. So this was one of the examples, study that got published in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine of a multi-site study, a randomized clinical trial that was performed by the VA. Now, just to go back to that idea of plasticity, how many papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, the most prestigious journal in medicine, has been published ever in stroke rehabilitation? I didn't say robotics, stroke rehabilitation. I heard that this was the first paper, but it turned out that this is the second paper. The first paper was 2002, the application of Botox for the wrist post-stroke. So for my surprise, this was the second paper on stroke rehabilitation in the New England Journal of Medicine. Now let me tell you a little about this study. So it was a randomized clinical trial where we had two groups, a robot-assisted therapy and a usual care. Now, the usual care in the VA is much better than the usual care in the general population. So many of the patients received three therapy sessions per week in the chronic phase for upper extremity. So what we did is that we matched the time in therapy. So robot-assisted therapy was also three times per week. Now, the VA was very interested in cost. So what they did is that in addition to matching time in therapy, they also wanted to match intensity. And the reason for that is that if you count the number of movements that therapists do with patients in a 45-minute session, so for inpatient, there were some studies that have counted that in six different facilities. For inpatients, it's of the order of 13 to 15, and for chronic, it's of the order of 45, while we are delivering close to 1,000 movements in the same period. So the DA wanted to have not only matching time in therapy, but also intensity. The treatment lasted for 12 weeks, three times per week, and in addition to that, we had a follow-up period of six months that there was no intervention between week 12 and week 36. The VA wanted to see five points benefit in the Fugelmeyer scale between the robotherapy group and the usual care, and of the order of three points from the robotherapy group over the intensive comparison therapy. Now, just a note of caution, the intensive comparison therapy we designed in that and didn't see any real advantage between that and the robot therapy. That said, we essentially had to make the therapist work delivering close to a thousand movements in the same period. So you had a clock behind the therapist and they defined the Charlie Chaplin version of modern times for therapy. So they were having to make the moves at the same intensity. And I'll talk to you a little more about that. So this is the population that was included in the study. They were pretty severe. For chronic patients, we recruited patients between 7 and 38 in the Fugelmeyer score. For upper extremity, the maximum 66 points. They had to be at least six months prior for the onset of their stroke. There was no upper limit to how many years had passed since they had their stroke. And while most of my studies include only patients that have their first strokes, the VA wanted to have a broader enrollment criteria, so they let people with multiple strokes be included in the study. These are the four robots that were used in the study. They showed an elbow, a wrist robot, an anti-gravity, there was a hand unit that was also mounted. Those were the four modules that the VA used. This was the intensive comparison therapy, so here there is the handle that the patient with the therapist has to move up and down to try to do the same thing that the patient was doing with the robot. Here you have the patient moving on a gravity eliminated environment. Here we have the skateboard that the patients have to. So there was an attempt to make a very good match one-to-one -one of what was happening. Now, when they designed the study, they had you know, three groups. Typically what you do is that you randomly assign the patient to one of these three groups. Now, one of the problems with the usual care is that you don't want them to quit because most patients would not receive anything extra. They would not want to stay in the study and I wouldn't blame them. So what the VA did, 
the patients that complete the usual care, they would have the option to select either the intensive match therapy or the robot therapy. So they would be able to select what they wanted and get the bulk of treatment. So that was done to have a better retention. But then the VA did something that I wasn't so happy, that if an intervention would not have an impact, they would stop that to save money. And then midway through the study, what they did is that they stopped the usual care, because usual care was not making a difference. There would be some consequences. So this is the result. So you have around 50 patients in the robot group in the intensive comparison, and around 28 because was stopped midway in the usual care. These are the characteristics of the population. These are veterans' population, so most of them were males. And one thing that I found quite interesting is that one third of them had multiple strokes. So it wasn't like just one stroke, but they had more than one, with an average at admission of 18.9 in the Fugelmeyer scale. Now here are the results, again, like a snapshot from the paper. One thing that then the VA did is that they decided to make a comparison between the robot group, the usual care, and the test comparison. They decided to make a difference in the paper just between the robot group and the usual care before they stopped the usual care intervention. I wasn't too happy about that, but that's what they did. And when you look at the scales at 12 weeks, the only scale that was statistically significant was the stroke impact scale, with Fugelmeyer not achieving statistical significance, although there is a strong trend. Now, if you actually compare the average of the robot therapy group with the usual care, you actually pass the five points that the VA was looking to achieve. Part of the reason is that they didn't let us train the therapists. So what happened is that the therapists need to be figuring out how to use the technology and they have a fixed amount of time to use it. So the patients would be there for an hour and they have to do what they could with the technology. So what you see is that if in the first half, patients improve a little over two points in the Fugelmeyer scale, which is nothing of big impact. If you look to the average, you would see that in the second half, patients were improving close to eight points in that scale, which represent close to 15% of the total range of the scale. And that was because they were learning how to use the technology. And that was quite nice to see. The other thing is that we are not only interested at the end of the study, but we also want to see what happens six months after we finish the study with no further intervention. That was very important. We are not only interested in seeing acquisition, but also retention of the intervention. And when we did this, the things got much nicer. Because now, even comparing just the first half of the robotherapy with the usual care, all the scales became statistically significant. The Fugelmeyer that represent impairment, the both that represent function, and the stroke impact scale representing quality. So all the three scales became statistically significant. And I already mentioned the difference of over five points. But actually, there is a few other things that is interesting that we have to read with care to understand. At 36 weeks, if you look at the measurement of the robot group with the measurement of the intensive comparison, we didn't achieve three points difference, and we didn't expect to see that. But we are off the order of two points difference. Now, the biostatisticians of the VA wrote in the paper that there was actually a small negative difference towards the robot. They actually said the robot was slightly inferior than the intensive comparison at 36 weeks. So the question is why? And the reason is how they did the analysis. They used something called fixed model. A fixed model is saying that they took all the patients from all the three groups, the usual care, the intensive comparison, the robot therapy group, they put them all together and got one curve that fits all these patients. And then they took that curve and translate it up and down for the particular group and estimated what was the impact at 36 weeks, which is different from the mixed model that you fit one curve to each of the groups and then measure that. And because they fit and the curves were all pushing a little down, that's why they are saying that the robot therapy was slightly inferior than the intent comparison when the direct measurement is saying the opposite. So these are just nuances, but it's important that not only you read the results, but you also read the methods, because I couldn't understand that until I went back and read the methods paper. Even though I was listed there, I didn't realize that that's what they were doing. Now, the next thing that they did, which I think was very interesting, is that they run a economic analysis. Very few people can do that, but the VA pay for everything that is being spent with those veterans. So this was published in 2011. 
this is how much the VA paid to buy all these four robots. And then they did an analysis comparing the different interventions. So the usual care didn't cost anything more to the intervention because it's the usual care. Nothing extra is being done. The intensive comparison, when they run the numbers, they were spending on those veterans of the order of $7,000 to deliver the intervention. For the robot therapy group, they were delivering of the order of 5,000. This includes purchasing the hardware and having a therapist work with the patient. So that already was a savings that was statistically significant. The robot therapy was better in terms of cost. But here came the big surprise for me. When they looked to the total cost that they were spending with those veterans, there was very little difference. The robot therapy group, they were spending on the order of $17,000 with those veterans, and for the intensive comparison and usual care, the order of 19000 This was the total cost, everything that they spent on those veterans. If you subtract from this the cost of the interventions, it means that for the old healthcare costs, they were spending less for those veterans. That was a surprise for everybody. Now, one colleague said, well, maybe the reason for that is possible. Maybe what is happening is that you are giving more attention to these veterans and they complain less about back pain and they come less frequently to see the physician. So that was a fair statement. So what we did is that we asked the VA to keep tracking the cost of this patient after we finished the study. And the hypothesis was, if it was placebo, what you'd see is that this cost would probably start going up after we stopped the study, because then you stop seeing the patients every day or every week, and therefore maybe they would start to move up. And what we saw is that for the intensive comparison, actually, the costs start to go up towards the cost of the usual care. But the big surprise is that the robotherapy group, the cost went even further down, not up. So that suggests that it's not possible. And here would be the total that the VA spent with the veterans, not only during the study, but till the end of 2009, when they stopped tracking the cost of the veterans that were enrolled in this study. And that was quite a nice difference. Now, I asked the VA because for me, perhaps the explanation was here. We stopped the intervention and the robotherapy group is still improving after. They continue to improve after you stop the intervention. And that was my suggestion to them why the cost kept going down because they are getting better. They are starting to use what they gain. They decided not to do further studies because the money was over for that grant. So we won't get the answer. But I think it's quite remarkable and a huge surprise when everybody expected, and the VA and ourselves expected a cost-benefit analysis to try to see how much more cost you get to get that benefit. It turns out that there is, when the VA is paying everything, there was no cost to an additional benefit. So it's summarizing the results, but just calling attention that of the 200 individuals that were screened, 127 were enrolled. So that represents two thirds. So for every three veterans, two could be included in the study. Just to give you a comparison, CIMP, the EXCITE trial, they had to screen 3,600 individuals to get 220 enrolled. So that was 6%. So this is a very broad and general technology or like a process of rehabilitation that could be used. So now that we finish this, I would like to talk a little about the different variables that might influence outcome, because that's something that we have been doing for quite some time. The first thing I want to be sure that we don't leave here with the wrong impression that it's just the number of movements. I was telling you that therapists typically would deliver of the order 45 movements in a 45 minutes therapy session. So you might have the impression that it's just making high number of movements. That is the main thing that we are doing. So our colleagues at the Berkeley Rehab, when we finished our first study, they had this question, maybe it's just the number of repetitions that we are doing. So what they did is that they got continuous passive motion machines that they had for the shoulder, and they replicated the study that we did. This was a small study. There were 17 patients in this group, and in the control there were 15. And what they saw is that there was no difference. There was a difference of six points and 5.6 points in the admission to discharge of the two groups. So there was no difference in the neurological scales. So both groups improved roughly by the same. The only advantage is that we also saw in the robotherapy group was that in terms of shoulder stabilization, 
that the patients that were doing the CPM as well as the robotherapy group actually had better outcomes in terms of joint stability. So to the point that today at work, what they are doing is that they have CPM machines and when a patient starts developing shoulder hand syndrome, they put the patient there to be moving the limb within a particular range. But that shouldn't have been so surprising for us. So this is from a book from Schmidt that I always like to refer. And he shows healthy subjects learning a new task. So when they are learning this new task, they are being mechanically guided. They learn very fast, but when you look to the transference and the retention, it's not very good. They can't remember very well what they did. Now, when you look to a group that they now are not being mechanically guided, but they are getting feedback throughout the trial, they learn not as well as the other group, but pretty decent and have a better transference. But when you have this third group that you give feedback after five attempts, this group would not learn as well as the other two groups, but they would have the best transference and retention, and that's what we want. We want not only that the patients learn how to practice the movement during therapy, but they also retain that when they leave therapy. So that's the same idea here when you think about training mechanically with a continuous passive motion machine. Now, this idea was good for adults with stroke, now the question is saying, is this also true for children of cerebral palsy? An adult, say like a man that is around 66 years of age and had walked around every day two miles, would have moved around the planet Earth twice before he will have a stroke. So he already have a very well established reference of what is proper gait, proper walking. But the child with CP, maybe they never had experienced what is the right movement. So maybe it's a fair question to see if just passive movement would have an impact. So here we made a small study where we have one group of kids that are actively playing with the robot, trying to hit the different targets, while another group of kids are actually paying attention to a video of their choice while the robot moves them around. So the passive group and an active group. The results that we got were similar to the adults. We saw that the different scales that were used, the active group is the group that improved. So most of the gains that we observed was in the active group. That said, this was the actual scales because the parent questionnaires, there was no difference between the two groups. So we have to be careful with how we run our questionnaires and how we make decisions because there was no difference in different scales, the PADI and a couple others that were designed at how much the arm was being used and how well they were using it. But what we came to the conclusion is that there was a significant difference between the two groups. So we can definitely observe visually even the changes. And that's why we are saying that both for adults with stroke as well as children with cerebral palsy, it's very important to have this active participation, not just passive. And that's where I'm going to end, because I saw once a colleague of mine, John Krakauer from John Hopkins, how can you define a technique, a modality? And does robotic therapy have achieved this level? So he defined that in this way. A rehabilitation technique needs to show gains that persist for a significant period after the training is over and that the gains should generalize at least within some workspace to untraining tasks. Now, I think if you remember the PA study, when we stopped the intervention, patients not only maintain, but they continue to improve in average. So I think I have shown you that we had shown a lasting effect. So we have like done, at least for the upper extremity, we had achieved this goal. The same would be for CP, but the last thing that I passed quickly and perhaps not very focused was this idea of showing that when I train the reaching and I measure in the circle drawing that they were not training, we see gains on both of them and they are highly correlated, suggesting that again we generalize to untraining tasks. So we believe that we had already shown the two main aspects that rehabilitation modality needs to have for upper extremity robotics, this long-lasting effect, and that it generalized within a limited workspace, of course, but it generalized to untrained tasks. And with that, I'm going to say that I think we can take this for granted now that plasticity is real, but that there is a lot of research that we still need to do to try to be able to tailor the therapy for particular patient needs and maximize the benefits that they can 
get it. Because at the end, what we are developing is a process of rehabilitation where robots and perhaps neurostimulation and other interventions are just components of tools for this process. But at the end, it's the process that matters. That concludes this edition of Audio Digest Neurology, a semi-monthly publication. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Peter, and thank you, Ego, in Japan. MIT, not everyone can go to Caltech, I guess. Um, so we're running a little late, and um, rather than take a break and then have lunch, we're going to go straight across the hall and start lunch.